we are in a specific period of time when God is doing a tremendous thing in the earth. One of the books that we uh, advertise there is God and Donald Trump. You can read it online, but it doesn't conclude like the book does. The book tells the story of the Hermit of Lamor in Italy, and it is a tremendous story, so you need to see the book. God is at work in planet Earth, and we're a part of a tremendous opportunity of God doing a unique thing, and we're a part of that. Matthew 13, if you have your Bibles, turn there with me, if you will. I want to minister uh, this uh, evening. I got triggered in a, uh, an article that was in World Magazine. This uh, article is the church that birthed the nation. And you need to read that. It's a very unique but distinctive story of a church that was in Holland. And there are 40 believers in Jesus Christ that were being persecuted. They left from the city of Leiden in Holland. They boarded the Mayflower to America, to settle in America, 40 people. They stopped off the coast of America and made a covenant together called the Mayflower Compact. They're going to establish a nation based on the Bible. Half of them died that first year. But they went on to make an impact. This article tells about it. It's astonishing. They founded a church as they landed. They established schools. They were able to settle into the purpose of God. And they went on to trigger moves of God, missionary movements. And it's an astonishing story. They reached their destiny and triggered a destiny in America. Matthew 13. I want to preach on destiny. Verse 31. Another parable Jesus put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but what it's grown is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of a destiny. Follow with my thought for a moment because here's one of the great stories of all time and the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gives imagery that is prophetic there, and as he says that, uh, seed contains a destiny. When I was a boy, I was fascinated by seeds. I'd plant bean seeds, I'd plant corn seeds, wheat seeds, uh, and uh, the mystery that was contained in those seeds absolutely captivated me. I would water these, I would wait for these, and of course uh, uh, there weren't enough to make any kind of a big crop. But I wanted to see the mystery of life unfold. I was fascinated by that as a boy. Because the mystery of life uh, was contained uh, in those seeds, and this is what Jesus talks about. Of course, seeds uh, have to reach a point when they're germinate, germinated. It takes time. It takes sunshine. It takes water. But within that seed is a destiny that God has placed there. That's one of the great mysteries of all time. Years ago, they uh, opened some of the pyramids in Egypt. And as they opened that, they took some wheat seeds out of that. Uh, 
that had lain there for 4,000 years. They planted those seeds, uh, and those seeds sprung forth. Uh, the mystery of that life was released, uh, and they bore fruit exactly like uh, the seed uh, life mystery that was there in that germinate. Jesus is talking now about the kingdom of God, and he's talking about destiny. He's talking about your life and mine. Think with me for a moment, because uh, the kingdom of God encompasses destiny. And uh, when we talk about destiny, we're talking about a future that God has uh, purposed. Jesus said, uh, when uh, this tiny seed is planted, uh, when it's grown, it becomes the greatest uh, of all seeds. Uh, and even the birds of the air lodge uh, in the midst of that. Uh, and this lets us understand that we, uh, as a human being, we also have a life and a destiny. Uh, and uh, that life and that said destiny is part of a larger picture uh, of God. Let me give you a definition of destiny. Destiny is a purpose God has ordained in you and in your church as its future. It's linked to the present dimensions and issues, but it's far beyond your own sight and experience and understanding. This is the destiny that God has in you as a human being because God often speaks of you as a seed. This is a picture of something that is in your church. Something's at work that's far greater than you have understanding for because God's purpose is always greater than you. 1970, my wife and I came to Prescott, Arizona. I was raised here, but as I grew up, I left, did time in the military, uh, uh, met my wife, married, uh, but uh, the church in Prescott was uh, falling on bad times, her ter a terrible moral failure, and uh, I was called and offered the pastor of this church. I wasn't eager to come because it had a terrible uh, disaster, and so in 1970, uh, my wife and I came. We had come over in Christmas time, 1969, pastoring in Carson, California. I was offered the pastor to this church. I wasn't sure that I wanted to come because they said it's been pretty much damaged. Not many people were left. But we came to visit my wife's uh, mother in Phoenix, Arizona. And when we came, we decided that we would come to pastor the Prescott Church. Not in my wildest dreams would I ever imagine I'd be standing here in 2017 and preaching in this pulpit and seeing the wonderful work that God has done. God's plans always are greater than you can understand. And America is a nation that has a plan in the kingdom of God. Now listen very carefully to me. Paul Stevens preached a masterpiece uh, in our uh, last winter's conference uh, about climate change. Uh, and we, many of us have seen that begin to come to pass. Uh, an election had just happened. There was a change totally of dimensions. Uh, and uh, America began to reap uh, the results uh, of the purpose uh, of God. Listen to this quote for a moment. Um, this quote says in 1900, over 71% of the world's evangelical Christians uh, lived in two countries, uh, Great Britain and the United States. And from there, they went into all the earth. The powerhouse uh, for evangelical renewal uh, has been the United States of America with its freedom of religion, its dynamism, and its wealth. That was written by a man who observed something that actually happened 
in the purpose of God. Now focus with me for a moment because Christianity is not so much what we are in the present time, but it's what we can become. Did you hear what I said? Christianity is not so much uh, what we are in the present time, but it's what we can become uh, in the purpose of God. And uh, there's an article that I have in my file, uh, and this article uh, is uh, entitled, uh, Small Church, uh, Big Impact. Listen to me very carefully, because here we see a seed a seed that began to germinate in 1970, not by any genius that we had, but because God was bringing to pass something which is called the Jesus Movement. We tied on to that. We did not cause that. We tied on to that, and that germination began to take place by key people. Think back with me now to Holland. Here are these people, some of them had fled England and were living in Holland. And as they're there, there's a persecution of believers in Jesus Christ. Forty of those caught the boat, the Mayflower, and traveled to America. Half of them died the first year, but God had a purpose. He's germinating something. And as I said, they stopped off the coast of America and they covenanted together that they're going to establish a nation founded on the Word of God, which is the Bible. Now ponder this for a moment because it's a very simple principle, and yet God. How many of you know that we're here tonight because of God? Can you say amen? We're here tonight because of God. There's no big shots around here concerning yours truly. Half the time, as this was all happening, uh, I didn't have the slightest clue what was happening. It was a marvel to me. He said, wow. (laughs) But God is at work, and he's at work tonight. uh, And what he's at work doing uh, involves America. If you don't believe that... uh, Why stand to the side and let others go that God's going to do. There's parallels here with our vision. We have locked on to a major principle. It's called uh, discipleship. Discipleship in simple terms uh, is working with people to allow God to transform them uh, into who uh, he wants them to be. Discipleship, in simple terms, uh, is working with people uh, to allow God to make them uh, what he wants them to be uh, and to reach their destiny. Every person sitting here tonight in this building uh, or this tent has a destiny uh, with God. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, uh, holy, acceptable unto God, uh, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind uh, that you may prove or you may demonstrate by experience uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect uh, will of God. That's your destiny tonight. God wants to bring that to pass. Evangelism is the dynamic that works this. I mentioned the hippie movement. The Jesus people movement we call the hippie movement took place. It began probably in 1963 or 62. Began to come to full course in 1967. When we came here in 1970, it already was beginning to wane somewhat, but that's a Jesus people movement. And we sent out an impact team. We sent an impact team to Phoenix, Arizona. We sent it into Encanto Park. And that evening, we went into a church 
And a hundred visitors came from the streets uh, into that church, which was my home church uh, that I was saved in. And as we went into that church, uh, the power of God was manifested in that concert that they did. There were 75 people from our church that went down to do that. That was our first impact team. Uh, we began to call them guerrilla teams. Uh, I had a niece that was a member of that church. Uh, when these hundred people began to come in from the street, one of them had a white uh, uh, robe on like Jesus. Uh, another one had a, a Levi jacket with a big uh, bolt action wired to it. Uh, there are all kinds of people from the street. Uh, my niece said, Wayman, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> well, I didn't. I had the slightest clue. <laughs> but God did. Yes, God did. Thank God for that. A young man was saved. As a result of that, became the youth leader of that church. And we saw people saved. But something happened in that impact team. That was the first one we sent, and we were thrilled when we saw the results because there's an addictive element to that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, uh, you know the house of Stephanus, uh, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. New King James says uh, devoted. The original word says uh, addicted, and that does carry the evidence. Now think about that for a moment, uh, because something happens uh, to people who are genuine believers in Jesus Christ when they see a life transformed, they get saved, uh, and they get changed. Can you say amen? amen. Something happens that is uh, supernatural. What happens is... Uh, Something happens to their brain that Paul relates about in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I don't know if you've ever read books about the brain, but the brain has synapses. And dopamine is able to be triggered in a pleasure principle. And if something happens when a genuine believer sees somebody saved and changed, it's addictive. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? It's addictive. So let's think about this for a moment uh, because there's a Holy Ghost rush that happens uh, when you are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ uh, and you see somebody experience uh, God's salvation. Uh, it is a spiritual experience to see uh, someone saved. As a result of that, of course, uh, we got into church planting. Many people, and plus the young people, they're interested how we got started doing all the things that we do. We evolved. We didn't see some book somewhere or some uh, uh, vision of a screen somewhere, but we evolved. As we began to obey God and evangelize, uh, we began to evolve uh, in some of the principles. Uh, and there's a book that's called uh, uh, the, uh, to the ends of the earth, and it describes it. It says the early disciples uh, had a missionary spirit. In this book it says when the Holy Spirit uh, comes in, a missionary spirit uh, comes in. So ponder this for a moment now as we're talking about uh, the issue uh, and as we're pondering uh, what you and I are here in this, uh, this tent for tonight. We sent our first church out uh, to, that uh, was, uh, was successful into Wickenburg, Arizona. We tried to uh, send workers up to Kearney, uh, Arizona. Harold Warner went, uh, had a wreck uh, which uh, crippled him for life, and he later went on and did it to uh, Tucson. But our first church that was successful was Wickenburg, Arizona. Wickenburg, Arizona at that time had a population of 1,500 people. I mean a metropolis. You can't think of any more larger city than that. 
In the wintertime, it had 2,500 because all the dudes from New York City came out to play cowboy on the dude ranch. We sent a rock musician into a cowboy town, and in seven months, that church was self-supporting. That's addictive. Can you say amen? That brings a rush. That does something inside you if you're saved. If it doesn't, uh, well, you need to go sell used cars somewhere. <laughs> Seven months, and that church was self-supporting, uh, and it made a rush uh, in our spirit, uh, in our personality, uh, and we became addicted uh, in our brains uh, to church planting. Hallelujah. That's how we evolved uh, into what we're doing now. So let's go back for a moment to our uh, beginning story, the original story of America. Here are these persecuted people in Holland. They were in an English-oriented uh, church, and, and uh, they wanted to take this adventure to come to America. They boarded uh, the Mayflower, 40 people, in an adventure to establish a new nation. Now this article is entitled, The Church That Gave Birth to a Nation. Stay with me for a moment. So sending these people from that church provoked more, spin, more sending. These 40 people, half who died the first year, they began to consult with the Indians who taught them how to plant and how to hunt, and they survived, but they established a community of believers. When that happened, then they began to send other people from there. And this article that I have about small churches, that church is still a small church. It still exists. The only time it didn't exist or have services uh, was when the Germans invaded Holland uh, in World War II. Uh, but here we have a small church, uh, big uh, impact. In this article, it outlines that small churches are the norm. Now, I don't know if you understand that, but the average church in America, and there are thousands of them, uh, are 100 people or less. That's pretty small. But small churches are the norm. Secondly, small churches are fruitful churches. This is not to make an excuse and keep your small church and say, well, we're just small, that's the way it is. But small churches are faithful churches. Not only that, but small churches are, matter greatly in God's eyes. There isn't a church that exists that at one time uh, was not small. Most of the mega churches that, uh, that uh, you would call us mega church uh, in our fellowship, uh, I've pastored, I, mean, I preached rather, in some of the first services, if not the first service. Uh, sometimes now they're running hundreds of people, very powerful churches, uh, but they once were small churches. Now stay with me for a moment. This is not to make an excuse, uh, but this is Bible. Uh, and the Bible says, despise not the day uh, of small things. Uh, this is in the scripture. So the average church uh, in America is 100 people or less. Uh, and let's look now at this story, uh, because the church uh, that birthed the nation uh, is a powerful, powerful statement. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, because from that seed of those 40 people, they begin to multiply. Others begin to be sent because their sending provoked other people to come. And the parallel is here is something that you need to see. When my wife and I came to Prescott, Arizona in 1970, I think our first service was January the 11th, 1970. We had a massive first service of 29 people. Seven of those were my family. <laughs> now think about that for a moment, because at the, pres at the present time, 
we have 2,432 churches in around the world. I didn't, I didn't plant all those churches, but the dynamic and the principle that we were led by God evolved has brought that to pass as you and I are sitting this tent tonight, 2,432 churches, and I doubt if that's correct. Because we don't always catch up with them when they do that. So let's ponder this for a moment. The church that birthed a nation. Joe Camel just came back from the Philippines not long ago, and he brought the news the first church in the Philippines was planted in 1981. They now have 400 churches in the Philippines. Are you listening to me? I believe our first church was planted in Holland in 1978. I had the privilege of being involved in that. I was just over uh, in Holland in August and the uh, preaching is interpreted in eight different languages as you're preaching. That's pretty hallelujah. <laughs> I was able to be there Monday and Tuesday, and it seems to me that Tuesday there was between 1,100 and 1,200 people there, and before the week was out, it was on up approaching 1,500 people in Zola Hall, a powerful move of God in England. God is at work. Think with me for a moment. I was over in uh, Fiji. I did the Fiji uh, conference uh, along with, uh, with uh, some others. And in the Fiji conference, uh, I was able to eat one night, have a meal after the service uh, with some of the uh, pastors. Uh, one of these pastors uh, uh, is from Vanuatu. He's sitting on my right. I got to talk with him a little bit. He pastors a church on an island that only has 300 people on the whole island. 60 of them are in his church. <laughs> Can you say amen? Thank God. So what about you this week? We're in a wonderful, wonderful Bible conference. And in this Bible conference, there is potential beyond imagination. Despise not the day of small things. Small church isn't an excuse for doing nothing, but you need to be encouraged because what you're involved in is always larger than you. How many thank God that God's at work? God's at work. He's able to do far more than you even ask or think. I'm doing a new Bible study. I'm pondering this, and I'm, as I'm thinking about the message of that, Bible, of that Bible study that I'm making, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for them, him that love him. Now, hold still for a moment. National Geographic just published, I think it was two months ago, uh, an article on, on the heavens. When people start talking about the vastness, I just get dizzy, you know, it's just so vast. Uh, now I've had preachers preach and they start preaching, and I say, you know, my, my head, it starts spinning. In our galaxy, this article said there are one billion stars and bodies, one billion. A billion's quite a bit. Not if you're in a government, well, it's nothing. <laughs> but a billion is quite a bit. And it said in this article uh, that there are billions of galaxies, billions of galaxies beyond our galaxy. That's a pretty big God. And the Bible says uh, that he has a purpose uh, in this. I make the note in the study that I'm doing. Do you think God just to say, I think I'll just, I'm just going to awe people. <laughs> say, a billion, a billion, a billion, a billion, a billion. 
I'm just going to show them. No, God has a purpose, friend. Can you say amen? amen. And that purpose reaches down. That vastness is the power of a God who is at work in your life tonight. Not only is it work in your life, he's at work in your church. And he's at work in your nation. And what about you tonight as we're sitting here tonight in this church, in this tent? What are you going to do this week, your pastor? In this week's services, God is powerfully stirring. He's going to stir hearts uh, to the possibility of what he can do. Not what you can do, what he can do. When I said to you uh, that I never dreamed, it my wildest dreams, uh, that I've ever be standing here tonight uh, in 2017 uh, and be only one representative uh, of 2,000 uh, 432 churches uh, and be preaching to a tent. I don't know how many is here. There's probably 2,200 in a tent here. Uh, by the end of the week, it'll be packed out. I would never dream that because in my personality, uh, I don't have the ability to bring that to pass. But God does. But God does. But God does. Will you open your heart this week? Uh, and obey him. If you're a pastor, you've got workers that want to be planted. If you're a worker, God has plans for your life. You have a destiny, and that destiny is a distinct possibility uh, if you surrender to God. Pastor Campbell did a masterful job in the offering that he took, uh, but as he took that offering, uh, we're going to have other offerings. Uh, and it's going to cost a lot of money. Our conferences are costing us uh, between a half uh, a million and five hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars has to be paid when we finish. Uh, but God has that money. Can you say Amen? God has that money. I know it's still in your pocket, but you're going to give it. <laughs> We're going to pay for the conference. God is at work, uh, and so let's ponder this for a moment. Let's go back to our original article. Here in this little town in Holland, in Leiden, Holland, 40 people out of a small church decided they're going to venture for God. And they decided they're going to venture for God from that small seed. Half of them died the first year. From that small seed, the principles of church planting caught hold and as they planted themselves they started schools they multiplied they started other church the news began to come and others began to be provoked and church after church after church and I read you that statement that in 19 uh, in 1900 Seventy-one percent of the world's evangelical Christians lived in two countries, America and England, and they went throughout the whole world. Much of that was gendered and inspired in the nation of America because people believed God. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. The church that pioneered...